in order to um, uh, have a, a, a decent life. And as far as he's concerned, the best meta narrative is one of faith. And he, he goes through three stages in one of his books, The Stages on Life's Way. And he argues in the first stage, once you have studied Hegel and you're convinced basically that life is like this evolutionary dialectical process and all the meta narratives that have been uh, uh, historically believed by people are all created by people, right? They're evolving stories that basically are created in order to explain things that we don't understand, but none of them are true. And as a result of that, what do you do? Once you don't believe any of those religious meta narratives are true, you live for a good time. You have a good time. And that works really well if you're a young person uh, and you're, you're you know, healthy and you want to go skiing uh, every chance you get you know, down, uh, um, down the slope. Why you would go up the tallest mountain you could get, put slippery boards on your feet, and then slide down them. It just absolutely amazes me. And people pay for this, you know. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have done that. I happen to be familiar with this because I have had a son do this. In fact, as far as I know, he still does this. And pays, you know, for an annual pass down there at Alieska, you know, and, and does this. And by the way, occasionally he's had serious injuries as a result of this. Because, you know, when you get down to the bottom or somewhere close to the bottom, you often run into things, which, you know, is not a good thing for the body. As a result, as you get older, you tend to decide for yourself that, gosh, this really isn't the best way to live. <laughs> You're getting too old for this. And so you end up then coming up with another stage. And for Kierkegaard, the next stage is the ethical stage. And his perfect example of the ethical stage is Agamemnon. You remember Agamemnon in uh, um, uh, the Trojan War, he was the king of the Greeks and led them uh, on. Uh, prior to being able to do that, though, there was a problem. The, the whole navy uh, got all stuck on a particular island, and the gods wouldn't let him go unless he sacrificed his daughter. And as a result, uh, all of his men wanted him to sacrifice his daughter, who he loved very much, Iphigenia. And he ended up deciding, okay, I have to kill the daughter I love, not because I really believe what the gods, the priests, are saying, right? Um, but because I'm expected to. My ethical situation, as a result of my social place, is to do something that I hate. And I'm only going to do it because I'm expected to. So he actually offers his daughter for sacrifice. And depending on the version of the story you read, she is sacrificed or not, or, or becomes kind of the, the a Greek version of the Christ, resurrected, um, and so on, except she's female, by the way. Iphigenia, have I mentioned her before? Yes, no, maybe so. In, in any case, you can look her up. Um, uh, there's movies about her, etc. Um, but Agamemnon is in this situation where he's ethically obligated to do something he doesn't believe in for the social good. And he does it, and hates it, and hates himself as a that result. That reminds me of the, uh, the story of Isaac and Abraham. Which is the next story that he goes to, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with it. Yes. Uh, so, so that's the one stage, is this ethical stage, which is incredibly unsatisfying, because you're doing what society expects of you, even though you don't believe it. By the way, it reminds me of, of parents uh, that have... You know, gone to college, they both decided they didn't believe in uh, the church, going to church anymore. But then they have young children and they decide, gee, they really need to take their kids to church. So they look around locally and find a church they think would be good for the kids. And then they go to church and they behave as if they're fine with the dogma of this particular church, even though they're not. Uh, but they're there primarily to make sure the kids get a good moral upbringing, right? Uh, there are people that are like this, right? They're going to a church, they don't believe in what the church espouses, and yet they're going because they want to be a good parent. Um, 
same kind of situation. So you're, you're acting according to an ethical norm that your community expects of you, even though you have no belief that it's a real truth, right? So the next stage is the stage of faith. And yes, the example he uses is Abraham. And Abraham in the story, of course, is told by God to take his son up the mountain and sacrifice him. This is uh, his only son. Now remember, there's the, the different variations depending on uh, um, which uh, version you're looking at, whether it's Ishmael or Isaac. Uh, but in any case, he takes his only son up the mountain. You imagine how a father would feel only having one son and yet being asked by God to sacrifice his son. And yet he seems totally prepared to do this until, of course, God stops him and offers the ram uh, as the alternate sacrifice, right? So it's a test Abraham's experiencing. But what Abraham demonstrates is that he's completely believe in belief that what God has demanded of him is true. And so unlike Agamemnon, who's fighting against his own conscience to follow a social norm, this situation is one where Abraham is actually fighting against a cultural norm to do his own uh, 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 obligation to the God that he believes in, right? So it's an interesting interpretation. Faith. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, Kierkegaard is fun to read. And I think that's one of the reasons he's so dangerous. I, I usually like to point out, beware, uh, studying this philosopher could be in a danger to your mental health. Because he's, it seems to me that every young person in, in America growing up through the school system reaches this stage of development and feels like the reason for living isn't what they've been taught all their year, all their kid, you know, as they were a kid. Uh, but instead, now they have to figure out for themselves what purpose their life should have for them. And they have to go through these same kinds of stages. And so if you're, you, you key into him right at about the age where you're going through this, he is immensely uh, attractive uh, to people. Um, but the trouble is, how does he get out of it? He doesn't. He never really succeeds. Um, and that's what worries me. You know, the people that get too interested in him uh, will also become as depressed as this Dane was famously. Uh, and where does that lead to, right? I don't think he committed suicide, but he did die just on the pavement after he took his last funds out of the bank. Kind of an odd situation, you know. Um, uh, what was the one book you mentioned again? The one that talked about him having bipolar disorder? Ah, Touched with Fire. Touched with Fire. By K. Redfield Jamison. Very popular psychiatrist. And healthy, by the way, now. There are medicines for what she had. Um, so, <clears throat> Kierkegaard. Very interesting to read. Um, and existentialism is essentially the philosophy that uh, really was very popular in Europe, although there were lots of different variants on it. Uh, but the basic uh, idea is that you're the one that has to decide for yourself with complete freedom what kind of life you're going to lead and what uh, um, meaning life will have for you. It's your choice. Um, Karl Marx, on the other hand, to him, I, I think it's pretty interesting when you look at his the pictures of Karl Marx and you see him when he was younger. I think there are pictures of him. That's wife, his wife Jenny, who was the prettiest girl in Trier. Trier, um, it's Engels, who's a wealthy partner. Uh, there's a younger picture of him with the group. There's another uh, picture of him with Engels, uh, and so on. Um, 
Uh, what this all demonstrates, as you can see, is that the more you study Hegel, the more your face looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought when I walked in this class. <laughs> it was when I saw you, it? yeah. uh, It's actually quite annoying. Of all the philosophers to look like, I really don't want to look like him. Because you know, he's got a, a bad rep, you know. <laughs> well, why the bad rep? Where, where is he from? He's um, uh, born in Germany. Uh, his family had been Jewish. But the father had converted to Christianity for the job opportunities. I mean, that's what they say. Um, and so he was raised a uh, Christian, um, Lutheran. And um, I, I, I have to point out, uh, and the reason I put this up here is Max Weber. Um, Max Weber was a sociologist uh, who uh, printed a book uh, um, called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And the basic argument was aimed at Karl Marx. And I'll, I'll explain why Karl Marx deserved it. Um, and, and that's um, that the idea of capitalism grew towards the end of the Middle Ages in primarily Protestant countries not Catholic countries. By the way, if you, you think about it, if you look at mostly uh, predominantly Catholic countries and where they are, uh, uh, South America, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, southern Italy especially, uh, what you see is relatively impoverished uh, people compared to northern Europe uh, where they're Protestant and very capitalistic and very uh, business oriented. Um, and in his book, what he argues is that the Protestant religion actually encouraged um, productivity in business. This is Ben Franklin, by the way. Um, uh, he, he's quoting Ben Franklin, time is money, etc. I don't know if you're familiar with Ben Franklin uh, much. Can you actually coined that term, that quote? That's a quote from, yeah, Ben Franklin wrote things. From, yeah, um, and he's, he's a fun guy to study. There's some good biographies on him. But he, he writes his own uh, biography of himself, and he's got his own book on how to live. Uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, um, um, but this paragraph especially, I think, if you, you look at it, um, the new religions, in particular Calvinism, and other more austere Protestant sects effectively forbade wastefully using hard-earned money and identified the purchases of luxuries as a sin. Donations to an individual's church or congregation were limited due to the rejection by certain Protestant sects of icons. They were iconoclasts. I've mentioned that. They white whitewashed the churches, did away with statues uh, and, and stuff, but encouraged musical instruments in, in the services. Um, finally, donation of money to the poor or to charity was generally frowned on as it was seen as furthering beggary. This social condition was perceived as laziness, burdening their fellow man, and an affront to God by not working. One failed to glorify God. Um, by the way, if you're, you're looking at the uh, conflict between generally conservative versus liberal folks with regard to homelessness, you see this, this conflict still. I think this really kind of describes how a lot of folks that are on. I think also like the majority of Catholics in America vote Democrat, 50% or something of Catholics in America vote Democrat. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. But, but um, yeah, you look it up. Yeah, you, yeah that, well, it's one of those statistics that actually goes like this, well, of course, depending of course. on what's going on. Um, yeah, but um, in, in general, what Weber is arguing is that religion causes capitalism. When we look at Marx, Marx will argue that the situation is reversed. Instead of religion causing capitalism, capitalism causes religion. 
Uh, and so what he does is he looks back over the history of, of the world. It's a very Hegelian point of view, but now what, what he's going to do is revise the way uh, he looks at history and argues that all of history is a class war. There's a series of different classes. There's lots of different classes in different societies, depending on how you know, that particular society ran, and that what was going on was a war between those different social classes. 